it's been said that humans are more alike than they are different. And at the molecular level, that is true. In spite of astonishing differences in size, shape, facial structure, and skin color, examining DNA, any two human beings are 99.9% .9 identical. In this episode of The Pursuit of Precision, The Science Advancing Individualized Medicine, we'll focus on population genomics. This allows scientists to understand how groups are related over time. We'll spend some time talking about the UK Biobank experience. I'm your host, Kathy Werzer. Thanks for being with us. Our special guests are Professor Sir Rory Collins, who is the chief executive of the UK Biobank, a huge cohort study with deep genetic, physical, and health data collected on more than 500,000 individuals across the UK. Sir Collins is the head of the Newfield Department of Population Health and professor of medicine at the University of Oxford, England. His work has been in the establishment of large-scale studies of the causes, prevention, and treatment of heart attacks, other vascular disease, and cancer. Also joining us, Dr. Matthew Ferber, a clinical molecular geneticist and director of the Mayo Clinic Gene Guide Laboratory. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. We're happy to be here. You know, since this podcast has listeners who are experts in the field, but also those who are interested in learning more, I think it might be worth our time setting up this topic, if that's all right. Um, Dr. Collins, how do you describe population genomics and its importance to individualized medicine? Well, I think what we're trying to do here is really understand what are the drivers of disease within populations. So, um, I mean, obviously, people are used to the idea of single gene disorders, um, say BRCA1, BRCA2 in breast cancer or familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, that causes heart disease at young ages. But I think what we're increasingly seeing is that um, genetics affect our risk of disease across the population, not just through these relatively rare big effect genes, but also um, uh, more modest effects of multiple genetic variation, uh, influencing the risk of, of many, many different uh, diseases, and indeed our, our response uh, to um, uh, risk factors, including, of course, we've seen um, during the last two years, uh, our response to infectious diseases. Dr. Ferber, what do you think when you think population genomics? Well, I think exactly the same thing as, as Dr. Collins, for sure. The, the other uh, piece that, that I'll add is that I, I think that as we start looking at population genetics and genomics, um, the idea of moving it from the research bench to uh, routine clinical practice is an area where I think we're we're very close uh, to to encountering. So uh, many studies, um, like the the All of Us study or the UK Biobank, are largely research focused studies and um, and that's a really great place to get started and they're looking at massive amounts of information, both common disease and some of the rare rarer diseases, uh, be it single gene or multi gene as Dr Collins just uh, explained but there's also a lot of activity beginning to percolate around doing large scale studies for just a handful of genes that we know have a really, really large effect within the population. And, and those are those are kind of two separate areas, one more research focused and the other more translatable immediately to the clinical bedside. I want to talk about the uh, UK Biobank for just a few minutes here. It's an incredible database, obviously, the, the whole genome sequencing of all 500,000 participants is incredibly ambitious. Um, Dr. Collins, what have been the greatest achievements of the biobank thus far? The altruism of half a million people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would say the vision of um, the Medical Research Council and the UK biobank. So the Med Medical Research Council is essentially our NIH and the Wellcome Trust charity back in 2000. Believing that there would be value in setting up something that would take 20 years uh, before it matures. Um, a more a straighter answer to your question, though, um, I would say is the, the observation um, based on UK Biobank, when, as Matthew says, you get very large numbers of people uh, with genetic information on them. Um, the observation that um, the combination of genetic variants across the genome, each of which has small effects 
in their own right on disease, but combining them um, can identify quite substantial proportions of the population who are at high risk. So you may be three to 5% of the population if you combine multiple variants um, who are at risk equivalent to a single gene disorder. So equivalent to the risk of uh, familial hypercholesterolemia and therefore coronary artery disease, or breast cancer, equivalent risk to BRCA1 or BRCA2, but perhaps 10 times more common um, in those high risk groups. And I think that that opens up the opportunity um, for what I kind of think of as precision population health. So you know, when we consider screening strategies, they're largely driven by age. Um, uh, women get to a certain age and then they get offered um, breast cancer screening or people get to a certain age and they get, in, in Britain, um, fecal occult bloods to see whether they uh, have any, any evidence of blood in their stool and a risk of colorectal cancer. The idea that you could identify with a genotype test, so measuring maybe a million markers across the three billion markers um, in your genome uh, and doing that for about $10 and being able to identify 5% of the population that are at risk of breast cancer, equivalent to BRCA1 and BRCA2, and the 5% who are at risk of heart disease, equivalent to familial hypercholesterolemia, and so on and so forth. Peter Donnelly in uh, the UK has shown that about a quarter of the population can be identified here in the top 3 to 5% um, for about 16 different conditions. So you can see how cost-effective that could be uh, in terms of delivering precision screening strategies, much better approaches to who we give preventive treatments to, such as um, cholesterol lowering therapy. Uh, so I, I see huge opportunities there. Now, it's something that needs to be evaluated, but I would say that that's a, a major observation that's come out of Biobank um, and is now being looked at as a way in which to deliver healthcare more effectively um, uh, to, to populations. You're also, are you not, in a sense, democratizing access to research? How important is that? Yeah, I think um, uh, what's been really interesting with UK Biobank um, is that the funders asked us from the beginning to make this resource available to everybody around the world on the same basis. Um, there is no exclusive access. I'm the principal investigator only in the sense that I've probably done less work on it than most people in terms of research. My job is to help build it. Um, we've actually had a lot of altruism from the academic community in helping us to design it, helping us to guide us as to what should be done. And then the job of UK Biobank is to deliver that. So um, uh, early on, it was around what questions to ask, what measurements to make, how to collect the samples in ways that would allow assays to be done at a scale that really was unimaginable when we were collecting them. But then you know, technology moves on at such a pace that we were genotyping the whole cohort well before anyone anticipated that you could do it in half a million people. And then um, we were contacted by Regeneron actually, who said, well, can we really access the samples? And we said, yes. So they brought together a consortium that funded the exome sequencing, and then those data became available to all researchers around the world. And likewise, um, a consortium of companies working with the Medical Research Council and the Wellcome Trust uh, most recently funded uh, the whole genome sequencing on half a million people. And when you think it's only 20 years ago that one person was sequenced, we've now sequenced in a two-year period at the Sanger and Decode half a million people, and those data are being made available. So um, when the genotyping data did become available, um, people started to believe that it was really true that you could access the data, and we saw a huge increase in the use of the resource from outside the UK. Um, and we've seen that increase uh, continue uh, into other countries around the world. So there are now some 30,000 researchers using UK Biobank data for all sorts of things that no one imagined um, at the beginning. So again, I think one of the beauties of the model is it kind of unleashes the imagination of all sorts of scientists who wouldn't otherwise have been able to access data on this scale and this depth 
and they do things that are really remarkable. Uh, Dr. Ferber, what can we learn from the way the UK has approached the biobank experience? Yeah, no, I, they're exemplary, and we should do, we we should really really work quite closely with Sir Rory and others to really uh, emulate the model that they've created. A couple of things that I want to bring up that were that Sir Rory just mentioned in his discussion there. Number one gets to biodiversity. Um, the UK Biobank is open to a wide diverse population of individuals. One of the challenges we have with making new discoveries is really the imbalance of different ethnicities that are represented in the existing data sources that we have now. Now, sure, really cool things are coming out of the data sets that we have now, but it will be cooler and it will be better as we increase the diversity across uh, across these resources. So uh, that's one aspect that I think is, is highly valuable. As valuable as the diversity in the people who are participating, so is the diversity in the people you're going to allow access to the data. So making sure that we have um, data available to researchers from all different kind of areas of, of subspecialty is super important. You never know where the next great discovery is going to come from. You don't have to be a point head geneticist like lab geneticist like myself you know in order to make the next big discovery it could be somebody who's very interested in muscle wasting or somebody very interested in uh, in cognitive function we just we just don't know and so making the data sets widely available to folks who are passionate about improving health care is 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 very very important and then finally i'll just wrap up and say that um all of those things start to add up to uh, the, a benefit of improving healthcare through uh, a concept that I think we've been talking a little bit about, but we haven't called it out specifically, and that's polygenic risk scores. And these polygenic risk scores are what Sir Rory is talking about, where they're common um, variants, but each one themselves have such a very small effect on, on any one individual. How those add up in a specific individual can lead to quite an impactful outcome. And that is what we kind of uh, refer to as a polygenic risk score. Now those risk scores are limited in their utility based on the populations that we've studied thus far. So you know where I'm going, right? Coming full circle to the need to have better biodiversity within these data sets that we have. Because the risk scores that exist, say for example, for, uh, for breast cancer or for even diabetes, they work relatively well for Northern European Caucasians and in and, and those ethnicities. But when we start talking about um, you know, uh, Chinese or Sub-Saharan Africans, they're not as powerful. And so we need the biodiversity um, that we've been talking about here to really be improved so that these scores really become helpful for all of humanity and not just pockets. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. And, and of course, the, the NIH funded all of us cohort um, led by Josh Denny, uh, I think um, is recruiting well in terms of um, getting diversity within the US. Um, our department in, in Oxford actually uh, set up a, a cohort of half a million people in China, the China Kadori Biobank. Um, uh, and um, uh, there are also large cohorts in, in Mexico. Um, but I also, you did want to pick up on Matthew's point about the diversity of the people who use the data. Um, so we were recently down in um, South Africa in Cape Town, uh, having a meeting to encourage African researchers to use the UK Biobank data. Um, uh, and the reason for, for doing that is that as they set up studies in Africa, um, learning from how studies have been set up in other places can be helpful in terms of how they do them. But I think also using the data in UK Biobank is a, um, a, a really good way of building research capacity uh, in Africa because they can access data uh, that are, are really complex and at large scale um, before they have those data themselves in Africa. And one of the things that we've been able to do with funding from the Wellcome Trust as part of the sequencing project was to um, put all of the data on a cloud-based platform, research analysis platform, um, that helps to democratize access even further. Because you don't need to have a big computer um, in order to be able to uh, 
uh, access the data. Uh, you don't have to download it onto your computer or even to, to run analyses. Uh, you can go to this platform. Um, and the way we've been able to set it up with the help of uh, Amazon Web Services is that they are providing free compute for researchers from low and middle income countries. Um, so this is a, an extraordinary, I think, opportunity, um, again, with the support of the, the sort of the community as a whole to, to increase accessibility uh, to the data for diversity in terms of people around the world, as well as I think the diversity that Matthew was also alluding to, which is around different kinds of scientists. Um, and I always kind of joke that there are people who work on doing fantastic things on, on Amazon because they can access data about clothes size and things like that. Health data has typically been more difficult to access. If we make health data available, then I think those people can apply their fantastic skills to these data, which really will be life changing. I'm curious, how have you surmounted any ethical issues when dealing with the biobank? Have you, have you had to um, tackle anything? Yes, one of the areas where there was a lot of discussion and debate um, at the beginning was around the issue of feedback. Um, so in UK Black Bank, there is a policy of no feedback of results to participants. When you initially hear that, you think what well, you mean, you'll see something in their DNA and you're not going to tell them. And the answer is, yeah, that's the, that's how they joined. They joined on the, the basis of no feedback. Um, and uh, that wasn't the initial position. The initial position was, well, surely we should tell them. But the problem, of course, is a lot of what we think we know is not necessarily accurate. Uh, so a lot of things we know about even genetics is often found in people with disease. Uh, and so when you find a genetic variation or a mutation associated with someone with disease, th th there's a kind of prior probability that it's causal. When you look in broader populations, um, that's not you know, the prior probability is, is different. Um, and it may be that you see a mutation in that gene um, and may jump to the conclusion that it's causal uh, and um, it may well not be. So um, the position we got to, um, the Wellcome Trust and the MRC got to, was the, the advantage of no feedback is you're guaranteed that you can't do any harm. Um, with feedback, there's a risk that you will feedback information that's actually wrong um, uh, or that you can't do anything about and causes harm in, in other ways. So um, uh, we, we spent a lot of time explaining that to participants um, and uh, getting their understanding of that and getting their consent to that as part of the, the, the project. I think that was probably the most complicated part. Um, and um, when we came to imaging 100,000 of the participants, uh, again, this question arose, you're going to image um, what happens if you see something you, on the image? Uh, and that was a question the funders asked. So we did a study, uh, a pilot study, where we compared if the, if the technician saw anything that concerned them on the image, it was fed back to the, the participant and their, their primary care doctor versus only things that were sort of seen in passing. So we had systematic uh, so, so anything that the, the te technician saw um, was then looked at by, uh, and all the scans were, were, sc were screened by uh, radiologists, and we had 20% got feedback, versus only if the technician happened to see something, there was feedback, which was about 2%. And when we did that, we found that the vast majority of the feedback was actually um, uh, led to investigations, some of them very invasive, uh, and the vast majority were false positives. Um, but people had normal ovaries removed, uh, lobes of lung removed, in order to find out that these things were false positives. So again, we, you, after about a year of um, assessing this, got to the position that um, if something was noticed 
during the scan, there was then feedback about 2%, but not the systematic screening that you might do in a kind of clinical setting. Interesting. Uh, Dr. Ferber, do you have any questions around this or a comment about it? Maybe not a question, but it, it, that is where I think the two studies are a little bit different. And I just want to be very transparent here. I am by no means an expert in what is happening with the All of Us study, other than you know our Mayo Clinic is the biorepository for the, the million participants. I know that there is a... Um, there's an interpretive arm to the All of Us study where they will be looking at either what we call the CDC tier one genes or the ACMG 59 genes. It's one or the other, I, my apologies. Both of these lists of genes though are um, discussed and settled upon by uh, ac a, an academic group um, here in the States that are deemed to be both important and actionable. So we, we know that variants within these genes um, lead to a specific disease um, and those diseases we can do something about either through monitoring or preventative uh, measures like prophylactic surgery. Now, the one thing that uh, Dr. Collins mentioned that is very true that we have learned over and over through the years in diagnostic uh, genomics is that your a priori risk for equating pathogenicity to a variant in, a, in an individual who is uh, struggling with a specific disease is, is quite high. So you can make those correlations easily. Uh, the converse is not true. When you have an ostensibly healthy individual who happens to be carrying a variant that you think looks like the type of thing that should cause disease, it's a little bit harder to, to make that um, connection. And so errors, even in the diagnostic lab, have been made uh, over the years where something looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it sounds like a duck, we've called it a duck, and it's not. It's not even a goose. It's just some, you know, it's a butterfly, and it's very beautiful, and it's just natural variation, and it doesn't do anything. BRCA2, um, the, the final exon, early stop codon is a prime example of this. Stop codons are codons that make the protein shorter than it normally should be. And in this case, it happens so close to the normal end of the gene that it doesn't really make any difference in the function of that BRCA2 protein. When we first started seeing that, we said, oh, it looks like every other pathogenic alteration that must be a disease causing uh, variant. And so prophylactic surgeries were pursued and other things happened. And only over time, as we studied and we learned more, did we realize that, oh, wow, that it's just way too frequent in the general population for us to really believe that this is something that's pathogenic. Now, there we got lucky because there was enough population data to say, you know, this isn't what you think it is but it very well could be a private familial alteration that is doing absolutely nothing that nobody's ever seen before. And it still looks like it could be the nasty version. And um, you know, we, we, you could inadvertently end up doing more harm than good. Dr. Collins, any comment before we move on? No, I, I think that, that's right. What we've tried to do is explain the way in which um, UK Biobank runs. There's no clean, you know, correct answer. I think the important thing is that participants need to understand, if you like, the rules of engagement um, uh, and to understand that not getting any information from us is not a clean bill of health. And, and what we did was uh, we provided information and then when we piloted it, we actually assessed uh, people's understanding of the information by sending out questionnaires and actually putting in false and correct answers and seeing whether they really understood the information. We then tweaked it more until we, we really felt that people understood what they were signing up to. And, um, uh, but uh, there are different ways in which one can do this. I think the most important thing is people understand what they are participating in. And we're very clear that uh, UK Biobank is a research resource um, not intended to benefit the people who are in it. Um, it's about their altruism in the same way that, you know, people give blood and they don't say who they want the blood to be given to. I just want to add that I, I couldn't agree more on, on that, that penultimate point there where 
making sure the participant understands what they have and have not had is the most important piece. Whether the UK, whether the UK Biobank decides to uh, not return results and the US uh, version decides to return results, those are philosophical questions that there is not going to be a very clear winner or divider that says, yes, they're completely right or no, that other team, you know, that they made the wrong decision there. What is really important is that at the end of the day, the participant understood what they were getting themselves into in the beginning, and they also understand the limitations of the testing that was performed. And one of those limitations are exactly what we've just been discussing. There could be a, a false positive result returned to you. I do worry quite a bit about false negatives. You know, people um, putting on the suit of armor, so to speak, and ah, I didn't get anything back, you know, so I'm not at risk for, you know, heart disease. <laughs> that certainly is not the case, right? You don't have a, a risk factor that we know about today, but we all know that there are plenty of risk factors out there, many of which uh, aren't even genetic. So making sure that people understand what they're getting, I think is the most important piece. Say, as we're talking about population genomics, I think we pro should probably touch on, if we could please, the issue of cascade screening, um, where the at-risk relatives of those diagnosed with hereditary conditions must be considered when looking at population genomics, right? So what are some of the concerns about um, the volumes of testing and counseling that are needed when you start talking about cascade screening? Yeah, I, I think that the the cascade screening problem is a, a, a problem that I am happy to have. Now, I know that not all my colleagues will appreciate me being happy about that, but necessity is the mother of invention. And having the challenges in front of us of, we don't have a strong enough workforce, right? We don't have enough members within it. We don't have enough digital tools to help automate some of the, the uh, automatable processes. So our team members can operate at the top of their, uh, their pyramid range, if you will. So they're doing the most important, most critical things at the top. And we're probably not investing enough in creating the workforce and those tools right now. So cascade testing is challenging as you presented in the question, Kathy, because it, it increases exponentially as we go down the family tree, the number of samples that are running through the laboratory, and then therefore the proportion of samples that end up being positive. And positive results become more challenging to, to, to deal with in most cases because there has to be follow-up, there has to be ed more education, there has to be a discussion of next steps. And that generally right now requires a physical interaction or video interaction between a genetic counselor or a healthcare professional provider and the patient themselves. So on that end, it is a huge challenge. And if we were to widely adopt this, there's no way that we have the workforce to handle it. But I am happy to have this challenge in front of us because I think it's going to force us to invent solutions, AI enabled, um, other tools based abled um, capabilities and growing the workforce around genetics and genomics that will ultimately take us to a place um, of victory where we know that people are getting the benefit of genetics and genomics without kind of forestalling and holding back that benefit because today we don't see that we have the tools. And Dr. Collins, I think you, you were mentioning earlier in the, in the discussion, you know, when you started off uh, genotyping, you didn't really have an idea. How are we going to do all of these samples, right? And the technology, because you jumped in, because you got involved, you got a good toehold, you made really good um, uh, lessons learned, and then the technology started to catch up and you start to hit your stride. And I think the same will be here, uh, true here as well. It'll be interesting to see what happens if genotyping arrays get rolled out across populations as well, because of course the arrays can be designed in ways that are um, informative um, in you know, not just for polygenic risk scores, but um, uh, to help, uh, if you like, identify people that you would like to do something um, better in, in terms of genetic uh, analysis. So um, I think we might see as the kind of the whole process of thinking about how to implement um, polygenic risk scores moves forward, then the question will be, well, with what? What sort of array would you use? And if you were going to um, genotype populations in order to use that information for polygenic risk scores, 
could you also use that approach to be helpful um, in um, identifying groups where you would want to do something a little bit more detailed in terms of um, genetic analysis, uh, particularly around a, 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 some particular area of the genome. I have one final question before we go, and it would be this. Do you think in order to move population genomics forward, there has to be um, a greater collaboration, if that's the word to use, between genomics, epigenetics, bioinformatics, you know, to, to as we as we look to the future here? Well, I think the 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 next phase will be uh, moving from the genetics into um, pathways as to the link between genes and disease. So, you know, we think about cholesterol lowering therapy. Um, the, the, the genetics came after the fact, in, in a sense, that we knew cholesterol um, was a causal risk factor, and then we found the genes. And then when we found the genes, we had a pathway, genes, LDL, cholesterol. Um, we're doing it the other way around now. We're getting a lot of genetic signals associated with disease, but much less in, um, information so far about how those genetic variations or mutations are actually causing disease. And um, where there has been a, a huge um, uh, progress in terms of being able to do genetics at scale, you to sequence half a million people, for example. Um, we're not there yet with um, proteomics. Uh, and I think that's really the next phase of being able to do very large scale omic assays um, that will um, build that pathway from gene to um, disease, and therefore help further in terms of identifying ways in which to interfere with that pathway to prevent disease. Dr. Ferber, what do you think? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I want to add um, on top of that, the, the exposures that we have over the course of our lifetime. You know, we just had a wonderful conference here uh, in Rochester, Minnesota for our Center for Individualized Medicine about the exposome. And I have to admit, going into it, I thought, well, how silly is it to give something that we all realize is happening its own special moniker? And how are we going to get our arms around um, really fully understanding this, this unapproachable amount of data. And then I took a step back and I said, well, isn't that what we said about the genome, uh, you know, back in the 90s? And, and we got it done. So uh, I'm really excited about all of the genetics that would genetics. So uh, epigenomics, microbiome, all of bringing all of that data together, but also marrying it with our exposome, because we know that pathology and illness isn't just us manifesting our own genetics. It's our, our genetics in this beautiful dance with our environment and our exposures and trying to pull all of this stuff together. So I'm, I'm quite excited. Trust me, I'm a geneticist through and through. So I, I love the genetics component, but I was excited coming out of the conference uh, last week or so to really look at how we're trying to attack this idea of the exposome. Gentlemen, I wish we had more time, and we do not, but I think we, we might have to go and uh, have another chat uh, somewhere along the line here on this because we had a, an awful lot that we covered. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Very nice to talk to you, and nice to talk to you as well, Matthew. Yes, thank you, Kathy. It's wonderful to talk with you, and wonderful to talk with you, Sir Rory. Truly a pleasure to have Professor Sir Rory Collins with us. He, of course, is Chief Executive at the UK Biobank and Dr. Matthew Ferber. He leads Mayo Clinic's Clinical Genome Sequencing Laboratory. We've been talking about population genomics. If you have questions or comments about what you heard today, do send us an email. It is precisionpod, P-O-D, precisionpod, at mayo.edu. And for goodness sakes, follow us wherever you get your podcasts. We will have future conversations about a number of different topics in precision medicine. I'm Kathy Werzer. Until next time, here's to your health and well-being.